Hello, I am Crystal Petrie and welcome to another episode of 60 Minutes With. I have the pleasure of sitting down and learning from Mayor Victor Trevino, who is the mayor of Laredo, Texas. So welcome to the podcast, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. So as you know, and as all of my listeners and my viewers know, we are right in the middle of a very heated presidential campaign leading into a very heated presidential election in November. And one of the hot topics um, is immigration and border control. And I wanted to have you on, Mayor, to discuss both of those things, immigration and border control. But we're also going to talk about Kamala Harris's immigration, Donald Trump's immigration stance. So again, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. So let's just hop right into it, Mayor Trevino. Polls suggest that immigration is a top issue, but a weakness among Democrats. Why do you think it's a weakness among Democrats? Well, it's, I wouldn't consider it a weakness. I would consider it a challenge because these are things that we need to, to look at, uh, not as problems, but as challenges. And whenever you have a challenge, we need to focus on, on the solutions. And that's, I think, what we need to do overall, uh, whether it's Democrat or Republican, solutions is where it's at. Okay. Now, Kamala Harris, who is the current vice president of the United States, but she is running to be president of the United States. She spoke at a rally in Atlanta recently where she pledged her um, support for a border bill that would increase funding for ICE detention beds, more border patrol agents, more immigration judges, is all of this possible? Will she be able to accomplish all of this if she's elected the next president of the United States, or is she just campaigning? No, I think uh, she has to focus on this because of the recent surges that have been coming from not only Mexico, but the majority are from all over the world. So we need to have uh, the ability to have more personnel and more people uh, actively looking at this uh, situation. But other than that, I think we need to focus on, on doing uh, immigration reforms that we have to do on our side and focus on the thing that uh, collaboration with uh, our partners, our partners to the South, especially Mexico, is crucial because I think that's where we can get the most cooperation and the most, most things done rather than just enforcement and uh, just uh, doing uh, punishments. We need to focus on, on, uh, on uh, collaboration because Mexico is the number one trade partner of the U.S. We have to step up to the plate and uh, think outside the box. Excellent. Excellent. Now, let's talk a little bit about Donald Trump and his immigration stance and the things that he is wanting to do. One of the things that he stated he wants to do, he sat down with uh, Times Magazine earlier this uh, this year and stated that he wanted to deport 15 to 20 million immigrants. He wanted to work with local police and he wanted to start with immigrants that have a criminal record. First of all, 15 to 20 million people, we're not even talking about immigrants, we're just saying people. That is a lot of people. Is that even possible? You know, that number sounds astronomical and uh, I would consider it an exodus of uh, a lot of people, but yes. uh, we have to look at the reality. Immigration is, uh, is what keeps the country workforce going. And we have to understand that we need immigrants to, to fill our jobs. We're, we're having a, 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 all businesses put to work signs that the work needed or employees needed. Uh, and and this, these are things that we ha have to look at. Now, the other thing about uh, people with criminal backgrounds, that, that, that does make sense because we don't want people that have criminal backgrounds coming in as immigrants. So th that is a thing that uh, would be a positive thing. But the thing to deport 15 million people on one stroke like that would be uh, unreasonable and I think would be uh, not uh, conducive to what we are as Americans. We're a country of immigrants. Absolutely. And I know one of the things that you spoke about before we got on the podcast 
was the Olympics are going on right now. Uh, they're getting ready to end, obviously, but it's the diversity that we are seeing in the Olympics that makes us such a great country and a great nation and leading in the medal count as well. That's true. And that's why we have been number one in the, the whole world for a, for a lot of things, uh, sports uh, and a lot of uh, other everything. We're, we're, we're considered number one. We're the leader with a strong one of the strongest, the, not the strongest co country in the world because of our diversity, our cultural diversity, our people from all the world makes us strong. And I think that that is our strength and we should keep that idea going. Yes, absolutely. So, OK, here is uh, two questions uh, concerning Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. What do you think that both of them should do to help with immigration and border control? Number one, focus on solutions and solutions not to continue with antiquated immigration laws that they have to be reformed. Number one. Uh, asylum is one step forward, but we need to do a lot more. We need to have people vetted in their own country and make their applications for citizenship in their own country to avoid people crossing illegally, avoid all the smuggling, avoid all the tragedy that happened to human tragedy and loss of life. That is not functional. I mean, we are not only a country of laws, but we are a country of, uh, we look at humanity. And in order to make policy, we have to include humanity, humanitarian efforts mixed in with the policy that we do. That is a great idea, Mayor Trevino, having them do the paperwork in their own country before they get here. It really would streamline the process. Exactly. And that's the way it should be. And uh, now that we need workforce, that's another issue the, the U.S. can can do certain programs and uh and uh, have people uh, do a work permits for a position that need to be filled here, but in a legal way. And I think it can be done. It's just a matter of sitting down and doing the logistics and making common sense immigration uh, reform. Common sense immigration is so important and it's su such a key thing that needs to happen. Um, so on the flip side, do you agree or maybe you don't agree with Kamala Harris's stance on immigration and Donald Trump's stance on immigration? Well, first of all, they need to be on the front lines to know what uh, what happens here in the border. And on my recent trip to Washington, we we're invited to, to uh, meet with Kamala Harris, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. And uh, one of the things that she does need to come is to the border and find out what happens here, how we live and work here, what the dynamics are here. Same thing to, to President Trump. He needs to know rather than just trying to make uh, ideas from uh, 2,000 miles away, it, it, it doesn't work that way. You have to know the dynamics here, the, the positive things and also the negative things. But being that we're in the number one port of entry to the United States with over $300 billion of merchandise that comes in on a yearly basis, this is uh, very important for the U.S. economy, and we cannot put a blind eye to that. It, it's intertwined security, commerce, immigration, and everything is intertwined. So they have to look at the big picture like that. Absolutely. Now, again, you are the mayor of Laredo, Texas, which is a border town but our border city, excuse me, but your city is also one of the safest cities to live in in the United States of America. I have several questions regarding this. Number one, congratulations. Well, congratulations you. on that title. That is absolutely huge. How has the city of Laredo been able to become one of the safest cities to live in in America? Well, number one, it has to do with binational collaboration. We have to have dialogue with our counterparts in Mexico. We have to talk the same challenges, to the same language helps a lot. But this is step number one. We just can't fight it with putting border walls or doing sanctions or militarizing the border because that would not be appropriate, especially if it's a number one trade partner uh, that doesn't go hand in hand of, of what we need to do. There's other better things to do. We have identified them here locally, 
And I wish the governments would look at this and follow our example. We call it the Laredo formula. That's why we're so successful in being so safe. This is something that uh, I have tried to share with uh, with even the state and federal officials, but it, it takes the the knowledge of the dynamics, how it starts to work. It starts with friendship. You start with friendship, then followed by collaboration, and then followed by reform. A lot of times, and this is not always the case, Mayor, but a lot of times when we hear about immigration, when we hear about border cities, it's in conjunction with um, crime, criminal activity, things like that. With Laredo being a border city, I feel like that really pushes back against the narrative that immigrants and border cities are filled with crime and it's not safe and you can't trust. What do you say to that? Well, that's that's why we're one of the safest city. You can walk downtown here at two in the morning and you're safe. Uh, but we have to understand that because the the immigration laws are so antiquated, that gives opportunity to the cartels and smugglers and people that that prey on people to thrive. If we had adequate laws and adequate rules, that they would not have that opportunity. So it depends on us as governments to look at that point of view so we can avoid them thriving in that fashion. I think that they thrive because the opportunity legally is, is very difficult. It's not uh, how it should be. It's, uh, it's dysfunctional sometimes. So all that we have to address so we can, we can uh, curtail this uh, illegal problem. You spoke earlier about the Laredo way. Can you give us one or two things that is incorporated in the Laredo way that makes your city so safe and so successful? Well, first of all, it starts with friendship, collaboration, and uh, meeting our counterparts, having uh, different uh, conferences, different uh, environments and entities that, that unite and talk about the same problems. When you collaborate, you start with friendship, then you know the people you're dealing with. And, and it's very, it's much easier to make arrangements and collaborations and go on the same page because their challenges are our challenges. So if we talk the same issues, then we can come to we can come to some solutions that are beneficial for both countries. Then rather, rather than everybody being on, on different pages and doing different different rules, and, and, and sometimes they clash one against each other. But uh, this is a way to do it. I have a very good relationship with both governors of both states that coincide with Laredo, the government from Nuevo León, Mexico, and the government from Tamaulipas, Mexico. We speak continuously. I speak to the mayor of uh, Nuevo Laredo across the river in Mexico, and we have uh, events, and we go to different uh, functions. This is the way to get things done, by collaboration, and we can get everything that, not everything, but most everything that would benefit us for both countries and both cities, of course. And it really sounds to me like you're just, you're saying relationships, build those relationships and build that trust. And from there, you can accomplish a lot of things. Exactly. And the commerce, this is also makes us, that's what uh, Laredo is the number one port of entry because they feel comfortable. They feel that they have uh, friends here that we can uh, facilitate everything. And we do. We, we cross over 20,000 uh, 18 wheelers a day through our ports wow. of entry, a day. Like you can't imagine what the amount of uh, merchandise is and the amount of logistics, the amount of uh, customs uh, collaborating. So these are things that uh, everybody else can mirror. I think we're gonna be eventually, hopefully the largest port of entry in the world if we continue this way. But it starts basic with collaboration and friendship. Absolutely, absolutely, Mayor. What, if any, what, if any challenges do you face in your city with border control? Well, border control is a, is, is a need. We, need. we need to follow our laws. We're a country of laws. But like I said, we have to include the humanitarian aspect. We don't want to see children f dead floating in the river with their mothers next to them. Uh, these are things that we do see, and that's a human tragedy. We're a country that, I mean, we need to get away from that. We're, this is not what we're all about. 
But we have to provide the right narrative to the rest of the country because uh, there's some uh, documentaries that portray Laredo as a, as a drug town, as fentanyl coming all over the place. We have to address these issues. And talking about fentanyl, the education of our public is crucial because the consumption is here and the, the demand is here and the supply is in Mexico. So we need to collaborate in both countries to get these things controlled. And I think we can do it, but we have to be a little bit more proactive. Right. Do you think that technology is one of the ways to be more proactive with fentanyl, as you were discussing, and even with border control? Yes, it is, because technology facilitates uh, the uh, Border Patrol officials to be vigilant of what's going on, whether there's smuggling going on in different areas and they're not physically there, they can they can uh, monitor that to the, to the technology of drones or uh, satellites or other other equipment and uh, sensors are, are along the border rather than just constructing a, a border wall or putting military units on 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 the on the on the border. This would send the wrong message to our largest trading partner to the United States. In other words, we need to have collaboration. We need to have things that work. We need to have things that are humanitarian and not go to old technology, 16th century walls and technology like that. How do you address concerns regarding the militarization of border control? That is uh, something that's dangerous because uh, it just takes only one incident across the border exactly provoke a conflict or a war yes and uh, these are things we don't want we're, we're we're getting away from that too many wars have happened already too many many people have died and we are more intelligent than that i think we're more progressive we have evolved as a people as a nation as humanity that we don't want those things to happen again like in other places of the world what would you say are the main differences between border control policies on the federal level and the local level? Well, locally, we live uh, that every day. We're in the front lines. So we deal with federal issues on a daily basis. And the difference is that we are here and we see the dynamic, like I said, we see what goes on, how it goes on, uh, what <clears throat> what needs to be addressed and what needs to be uh, looked at a little bit further, and we can share this information with our federal partners, which we try to do constantly. But I think they have to be more aware of what the reality is, rather than the, the perception they have, uh, the, the narrative that happens in the rest of the country about our border cities is all mostly negative. It's about uh, drug wars, cartels, and human smuggling. Hey, this is the number one port of entry, and we are the safest city, one of uh, the, uh, not the safest city in the country. How do we do that? That needs to be also portrayed in the narrative. Do you feel like the federal government has been receptive to receiving information and feedback from local governments such as yours? They are, but we have to go. I've been to Washington several times and that's that's a message I give, but I'm only one person. They need to come down here and look, look at the situation for themselves. And that's why I invited Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris, to come down to the border and see what's going on, see how we handle things, see how safe it is that you can walk on the streets at two in the morning and nothing happens to you, uh, contrary to other cities in the United States. So how do we do that? That is the, the what they need to see, how we collaborate with each other. And we're a family-oriented town, so that really helps a lot. What did Vice President Harris uh, respond with with your invitation or has well, she responded? I, I, I'm just putting out the invitation. We just went out to her uh, her, her um, event that she had at her residence, mm -hmm. inviting the Latino community, Latino leaders to, to uh, be on board. So, uh, but I think that she needs to come down here and the invitation is already put out so she can see firsthand and uh, she can have a better uh, understanding a uh, front frontline view of what how things are and i think this will help her in her campaign and to understand what resources need to be sent to the border how do you balance the need for more security at the border 
with also protecting and ensuring human rights? Security and human rights go hand in hand. And uh, it, it is uh, sometimes difficult to just uh, uh, enhance security and not, not have the humanity involved. Uh, most all the agencies we have here, it's not all the agencies, we have about over 10 or 11 agencies, police agencies, federal agencies, state agencies that work hand in hand. We have a, a, uh, a, an entity that has all these agencies together that collaborate with each other and they get it. They get it that this is not a just a straight uh, idea of doing things in a, in a certain uh, military way. It's a, a it's a very complex, it's a lot of human uh, uh, events that they have to look at. So they get it because now that they have lived and work here, it's not a one size fits all. Uh, there's a lot of situations where there's families, where there's human suffering, where there's children. And uh, it's not a simple thing. You have to really live the dynamics here to understand. So I think collaboration is the, the name of the game. And really, and I know we're talking about immigrants and immigration, but when you are dealing with people, when people are thrown in the mix, it is never a straight line, ever. That is correct because there's children involved, there's elderly involved, there's women, uh, and there's people that are very uh, needy to a lot of situations, not only uh, uh, nutrition, but uh, housing and, uh, and being outside their elements. There's a lot of things, and sometimes they, they're fleeing from, from extortion, from persecution, from rape. And these are different things. Uh, uh, all these people are called immigrants, but I think some people need to call, be called refugees. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you give us the difference between the two, refugees versus immigrants? Well, an immigrant is a... a person that's uh, leaving his country and going somewhere else uh, to work or for a better life versus a refugee is fleeing persecution, torture, rape, war. And that is quite different. The, the, the reasons they're coming are quite different and uh, they're drastically, drastically apart from each other. As mayor, and I don't know if this falls under your preview or not, Mayor Trevino, how do you ensure that border control policies are fair and non-discriminatory? Well, we have to uh, work hand in hand with our with our law enforcement agencies, our non-governmental institutions also that house uh, immigrants. And we have to be on an ed education mode. We have to educate our law enforcement to understand that not everybody is a criminal and uh, immigrants are not criminals. We have to change that, that point of view where uh, some people, uh, even politicians, criminalize all immigrants, and that's not, that's not right. So uh, as long as we understand that these are human beings, these are people that have families and children, and they have lives, this is important for them to understand that, and we, we strive to do that education. We strive to portray that message, and I think that that's where it's at. And for me, in the, the research and the reading that I've been doing, Mayor, the majority of the people that are coming over are not criminals. It's only a handful that are, but though the, the few, the very few criminals, those are the ones that are highlighted. That's what we see in the media. That's what we see in social media all the time instead of the people that you're referring to, the moms, the, the dads, the, the children that are fleeing from war or rape are really just coming over for a better opportunity and a better life. Yes, and you're absolutely right. Uh, there's only a handful. We need to identify them. And uh, regretfully, uh, they give a bad name to, to immigrants. But uh, overall, all the most of the immigrants we see, we see them family units. They're mostly family units. Very, it's not as common to see single males. So when you see a family unit, uh, it doesn't fit the the, the character of them being uh, criminals. I mean, a family unit and children and and elderly people do not fit that profile. So I don't think they should be named that. And and of course we have to weed out the the bad elements. And that's absolutely a must. 
but we have to be a little bit more intelligent. We have to be a little bit more humanitarian. What would you say, and we're going to uh, start talking a little bit more about immigration in this next uh, part of the podcast. What would you say are the main drivers of immigration to your city? Mostly it's work. They're seeking work, a better, better life, uh, quality of life. Uh, it's not that they come here to steal and rob and everything like it's portrayed. They, the main attraction is work. And as long as there's work, they will come to work. So if we have a need for workers or a workforce that is depleted, uh, people are not having as many children so our, our youth is it's not like it used to be. We need to focus on how we can make this work in a legal way uh, do work incentive programs, immigration programs that include only uh, a workforce with temporary workers, things like that, that that can be done. And there's many ways to do it. I think uh, if we focus on how to solve the problem rather than to just uh, criticize it, then I think we, we can make headway. Speaking of solving, solving the problem, solving the challenges, how do you support the integration of immigrants into your city? Well, one of the things is that uh, we're 95% Hispanic here, so it's not a difficult situation for us. Of course, they're from other countries, they have other uh, cultures and uh, other ways of thinking, but it's it's easily uh, identifiable here. This is not, and mostly everybody doesn't stay here. They, they wanna go to other places in the United States. So for us, it, it's not that great of a problem to, to assimilate their culture into ours. And people who do stay here, uh, they, they adapt very quickly. What programs do you have in place in Laredo, Texas for immigrants that are looking for and seeking employment? Well, number one, we have the non-governmental institutions that, that house them in the meantime, to give them orientation, to give them uh, information on uh, what the country is like, uh, where to go, where not to go. And uh, we also make an effort to contact their family members uh, of their originating country to let them know that they're safe here. Uh, and if they need any, any more support, ask them to send money for them to, for their travels. So those are things that we're, we're helping in them. And, and uh, of course, to, to register as an immigrant and uh, so they can have uh, a status that would be not illegal. And uh, this would, this, these are things that I think are very helpful for them. What, and I know we've talking a lot about um, a lot of immigrants are considered criminals, which of course we know is absolutely not true, but what are some other misconceptions about immigrants that you would like to address? Well, one of the things that they say is that they come to take our jobs and uh, that is not true. They take the jobs that nobody wants, like dishwashers, like construction people, uh, garden people, uh, things that uh, we're very deficient in, in our workforce and it's been depleting constantly. So they take those jobs. It's not that they're going to take your your job that uh, of mainstream mainstream Americans. That is not true. They're taking the jobs that, that nobody wants. And uh, these are hard jobs. They're, they're outside. They're in the elements. Uh, there are also agricultural jobs that nobody wants to go and pick uh fruits or grapes, things like that, they take those jobs. So I think uh, there's a necessity to, to get these immigrants uh, working. But I think, uh, again, we have to do it in the correct way and legally. How does education institutions help with immigrants coming into your city, Mayor? Uh, it is important for them to, uh, to learn the language here. And in, in our city, we're bilingual. Everybody speaks both languages. So schools are also having, uh, in case they stay here, the schools also have a bilingual educational problem. In other words, they're taught in both languages so they will understand what, what's going on in the classroom. And children that only know, speak one language will be lost if uh, everything is in English. So that bi bi uh, um, lingual problem, bilingual uh, program really helps them. I think it's, it's a step forward and they assimilate the, the English language very quickly. How has immigration positively infect, uh, affected, excuse me, your local economy in the city of Laredo? 
our economy needs immigrants. We need people from uh, the Mexico side because uh, of our uh, international trade and commerce. Our uh, 18 wheelers require a lot of what we call transfers here, where we uh, get loads coming uh, into our city and then they have to return back for other loads. And these are people that uh, might uh, fill those positions because uh, can you imagine 20,000 or more 18 wheelers? Uh, you need uh, very, a lot of a lot of drivers, and uh, on on this field they would they would fit in uh, also in the in the warehouses where they have to do uh, the loading with forklifts uh, and a lot of uh, identification of merchandise. There's a lot of work here that uh, they would fit into. How do you address the strain on local resources caused by? immigrants coming over. And this is me assuming that there is a strain. There might not be, but if there is, how do you address that? Well, the beginning where there was a the tremendous amount of surges, we did have to ask the federal government for uh, help with uh, NGOs and non-governmental institutions and the, and the religious charities that uh, needed some uh, funding for meals and, uh, and housing and clothing. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's not as bad. The um, the surges have been decreasing uh, as as uh, when the asylum new uh, rules were placed in, the the surges decreased. We're less than forty percent of what it was before. So that was a step forward. And I think that that now that they know they cross illegally, they would not be uh, entitled to asylum. That has helped. So, so they do their their paperwork and their country of origin. How do you address the conflicts that arise from immigrants coming into your city? Well, uh, like I say, it's not usually a conflict because they they are very well, uh, I guess, uh, welcomed because uh, we see people that need that need the humanitarian help. Their children need help. They need food, and you don't see. I mean, we're we're a very giving community here because we we think we're family oriented and we we know that uh, that families need to survive, family need have needs, and this is just uh, what we are as humans. I think this message needs to be all over the country. First of all, we're humans before we're anything else, before we're citizens of any other country. Yes. So we look at it that way. And myself, as a medical doctor. I see this situation that it's a must. You need to provide health and uh, food security to people wherever they're from. I mean, you just don't let them deteriorate and die away because they're not uh, legally here. Exactly. And I feel like if more people, politicians included, saw them that way as humans first before they're immigrants, humans first, before we're thinking of border control and everything else that goes along with it, this situation would be so much easier to handle. I think so. Uh, and we need to remember who we are. The United States of America, we're made of immigrants, and who we are, we're the beacon of humanity for the world. So we need to keep that. We need to portray that. Right. We need to portray that and live that. Exactly. Correct, Dr. Trevino. How do you measure the impact of immigration on local schools and healthcare systems? Well, we're medically underserved to start out with. During the pandemic, we had uh, a lot of surges. Uh, I was a health authority during that that time. I was not mayor yet, but uh, it was uh, challenging because we had to come up with strategies to uh, not only help our our citizens, but we had migrants also and. We had also uh, residents from our sister city in Laredo that needed uh, assistance because uh, the vaccines were not available uh, in some countries that were not available in Me Mexico yet. So we vaccinated uh, over 350,000 people during that pandemic here. Uh, and uh, I, I, I take pride in that because I think that was a great humanitarian effort to to vaccinate both sides of the border. We just can't, if we live and work and we cross every day, we're the same people. We just can't vaccinate one side of the border and not the other one. So that health uh, uh, initiative was very good, but we still need better hospitals or not better, more hospitals. We have two great hospitals. We need more hospitals, 
Medical personnel were also depleted. We're a third of the doctors here that need to be in our community are a size of 265,000 plus the, everybody that goes, comes and goes through our city. So these are challenges that we have to meet. And uh, now we're, we're looking at uh, doing residency programs and hopefully we can uh, do pediatric intensive care service. And one more thing I wanna put out there is to put a medical school in our community. That is a great idea. How do you think that would benefit your city and the immigrants coming over a medical school? Well, uh, doctors that get trained here would hopefully stay here and not all of them, but at least that would increase the number of doctors that we need. And the services to this migrants would be more readily available. They would have more opportunity to see residents that are doctors in training that would also help with, with treating the, the migrants. Uh, I think all of this would, would just be a win-win situation for all of us. Yes, absolutely. What would you say, Mayor Trevino, are the responsibilities of local government in managing immigration issues? Local government has to be uh, aware and in tune with what our needs are. And mostly all the local agencies are. We have a great collaboration here with all all our federal partners, state partners, and, and local um, authorities. Whenever we have situations like uh, like uh, migrant surges, whenever we have the pandemic, we had the pandemic, or whenever we have a, a um, emergency declaration, we all pull together because we are 150 miles away from any major city, 150 miles away from San Antonio, 150 miles from Corpus Christi, 150 miles away from uh, Monterey, Mexico. So we kind of have to fend for ourselves. So that, that is one of the reasons I think we, we pull together and help our, our, our citizens and, and also and anybody that needs help. Do you think that local governments, local councils should be the leader when it comes to immigration and border control and the federal government, for lack of a better word, should follow in those footsteps? I think so, because uh, the mayor has to be the voice of the people and has to lead the people. And whenever there's uh, good events or good things happening in the city, the mayor needs to, to bring them out. But also when there's challenging situations or disasters, the mayor has to be at the forefront and people will be will feel safer, will feel that they're, they're being protected. Uh, when the mayor comes out and, and leads the people and gives them the information that they need. Do you collaborate with other cities facing similar immigration issues? And if so, what are some of those cities and what does that collaboration look like? We do, and we have a South Texas Alliance of Mayors. That's an entity that we have and we meet. Our next meeting will be here in Laredo, Texas. Uh, we just had one meeting in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, we meet quarterly and we bring out all the challenges that we have that uh, that's common to all the border cities. We have we share ideas and uh, we we help each other and, and what we're doing with our surges. And not only that, we also get transfers from other border cities for uh, for processing here in Laredo. So this is a way we 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 share that uh, that uh, challenge with all the border mayors and the border cities. I think uh, this is an entity that is not only has uh, political power, but it, it, it's also important to, give, uh, to have funding uh, appropriated to us. Mayor Trevino, what policies have you implemented in your city to improve the lives of immigrants? Well, the NGOs, uh, we, uh, we support the NGOs through funding. Uh, these are important because when they come, we don't want them uh, to be living on the streets and, uh, and children out on the streets. So we put them on the NGOs where they get shelter, they get uh, information, they get food, and they get uh, orientation. So this is very functional. We don't have like homeless on the streets because of that. And if we do have homeless, they're not, they're not immigrant. So these are the things that we do to, to help them with their, with their journey. And can you explain to us what and uh, give us what NGO stands for and explain to us what that is? NGO is a non-governmental uh, organization. 
like uh, religious organizations and organizations that uh, uh, that exist for for this purpose. Now they get funding uh, through the city. We give them some funding. The federal government gives us some funding, and they help out because so when we had uh, up to a thousand migrants arriving from other cities, uh, they would get referred to us because we're a processing center, and they would have to stay at the, at these NGOs. Uh, rather than being on the streets, and they would be processed by uh, CBP, Border Patrol, uh, to give them uh, orientation and uh, to send them on their way to where they were going. Also, we would provide uh, the way to go. Sometimes we would get them bus tickets. Uh, we try to get the, the funding sometimes from the state. The state would give, uh, send some buses, and but we would try to get some funding from their family members uh, where the, on the country they, they came from. So all these things, it's a coordination effort to, to help these people uh, and, and do a humanitarian effort, basically. How do, and I know earlier in the podcast, you said that your city, the city of Laredo, is about 95% Hispanic. But how do you engage and educate your community members that are already living there that are not immigrants when it comes to immigration? How do you engage them? How do you educate them on the topic? Well, I think uh, that's already inherent to all the people here because Laredo was one city in the past. It was uh, Laredo, uh, Spain, and uh, it was founded by Spaniards and uh, wars happened throughout the countries. And now we have a Laredo and a Laredo that was divided in, uh, in 1848. But the, the people are the same. So we're the same people who have relatives, uh, cousins, brothers, sisters. So it's a, it is not an issue to, to assimilate those people because uh, we know that we are the same people. We need to help our people. And uh, these are not people that uh, are strangers. Uh, and the way we think like we're family oriented, oriented with the way we think we we think that we have to help our fellow citizen our fellow man because that's the way we, we need to do i mean uh, uh, we are religious people also and that has a lot to do with it okay what do you think can be done and we've talked about this at length during this podcast about the the negative narrative when it comes to immigrants what do you think and what strategies do you think need to be implemented to address the anti-immigrant um, narrative that we have going on? We have to remind everybody that we are the United States of America, number one. What that means and what we're all about. Number one, we're forgetting that, that we're trying to have groups of people own the country. That's not right. We are one people, very diverse, but with one common thing in mind that we're all American citizens. Absolutely. And I have a few more questions for you, Mayor, then I'll, I'll get you out of here. I know you are very busy. So again, thank you for sitting down with me on this podcast uh, this morning. What are your plans for future immigration related initiatives? Well, I think we we more or less have gotten a, a handle on things on how how to deal with the immigrants, but uh, we have to strive to inform our our federal partners that, like I said, immigration laws have to be reformed, better situation for immigrants have to be provided. Work with other countries rather than punishing punishing them, incentivize them, and have them do immigration reform in their own country and have other situations that uh, are not just putting border walls and uh, and increase barbed wire and dogs and things like that. We need to incentivize other countries that we're all humans and we all live in, and work in this world. We have to help each other. And being the United States of America, I think that, that that's our basis on who we are about uh, of the people we are. Mayor, I know earlier you said that you were getting ready to create the invite for Vice President Kamala Harris to come out to your city and see firsthand what that looks like and what that feels like. Are you also creating an invite for uh, former President Donald Trump to come out to your city as well? Yes, uh, anybody that uh, 
can help our community and uh, is not uh, doing any uh, negative rhetoric is welcome here. We want people that uh, are looking to help the whole country, help our citizens and help everybody, not to divide people. We don't think that division is anything helpful for anybody. Uh, we want to unite everybody. We want the country to, to, to thrive. And the only way to do it is that we work together. Okay. What, and my final question, Mayor, how do you measure success? Because the city of Laredo has a lot of success with immigration, border control, and also, again, being one of the safest cities in the United States to live in. How do you measure the success of your immigration policies and programs? Number one, putting number one, that we are all human beings, we're all citizens, and we are all caring about each other. Like, I care about you right now, you know, <laughs> because I care that you get the right information. And if you're here in Laredo, we'll show you a good time, we'll take you to the best restaurants, and we'll treat you like you should be treated. That's the way to do it. And I think that that's what portrays Laredo being very friendly, very family oriented and caring about fellow citizens. Thank you again so much, Mayor Victor Trevino, the city of Laredo, Texas. I appreciate you so much for taking time out to be on the podcast and educate myself as well as my, my audience and my listeners on Border Patrol and immigration policies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate any time. Thank you.